Good afternoon, and welcome to the latest edition of Observation Point Live. I am your host, Chuck Hobbs. Over the last six or seven months, we all have been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the greater issues that we have all faced is the fact that the economy has begun to tank. In March and April alone, there were nearly 22.2 million jobs that were lost across America, according to statistics from the United States Department of Labor. And as recently as August of this year, that same department indicated that only 42 percent of those jobs had returned to the market, mostly in retail and in restaurant in the restaurant industries. So with that, one of the things that I have been talking about at length with a number of my friends has been what have people been doing to offset some of the economic losses that they have faced over the last six or seven months? And to a surprise, to my surprise, one of the main impetus that people have focused on has been creating their own businesses. So with that today, I am bringing in two very dear friends of mine from my day of, days at Morehouse College. One, my classmate, Teddy McDaniel. The other, my classmate, Malika Dowdell. Like to bring them on. How are you all doing this afternoon? All right, doing great. Glad to be here. So all happy right. to be here. Good to see you. Yeah, no, no doubt, no doubt. And uh, we were having fun in the broadcast studio before we began. I'm looking forward to getting back in the broadcast studio once we're over. But with that, Ted, as you know, as Morehouse men, we're always gentlemen first. Malika, I would like for you to go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience. And then, Ted, you'll go second. Sure. Thank you. Well, again, thank you so much for providing this platform. Chuck, all the work that you're doing is amazing. So I'm happy to be here. I am Alika Dowdell. I'm a proud class of 1994 graduate from Spelman College. Uh, from Spelman, I went and got my MBA at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Um, most recently, I actually just completed a certification through Cornell for women's entrepreneurship, and that was underwritten by Bank of America, so shout out to them. And I have been a brand marketer for over 20 years. I've had um, the, the blessed experience uh, to have worked for Miller Brewing Company, uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, American Express, um, Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and now I am the principal at DNA Marketing. And again, happy to be here. So thanks, Chuck, uh, for having me. Uh, it's great to see classmates and old friends. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Teddy McDaniel. Uh, I, I serve as the president and CEO of the Urban League of Central Carolinas in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I, too, am a proud member of the legendary class in 1994 of Morehouse College, um, third generation of my family to, to complete Morehouse. Um, after Morehouse, I got a finance degree and went straight to New York. Uh, so I spent nine years in New York. Um, starting at Chase Manhattan Bank and working in various uh, financial services uh, uh, banks and, and institutions over those nine years. And I developed a focus uh, in, in franchise restaurants and hospitality businesses, hotels included. And so um, in uh, the late 90s, I ended up uh, working for a small boutique firm called FMAC, a Franchise Mortgage Acceptance Company. Uh, and, and at that time, I also joined the board of the Stanford Urban League in Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, fast forward uh, to uh, going to GE Capital in Phoenix in 2004. Uh, I joined the Greater Phoenix Urban League Board of Directors. And in 2008, uh, I left GE and became the chief operating officer of the Greater Phoenix Urban League. So I've been in the Urban League movement now for close to a decade. Um, before moving to Charlotte three years ago, I was the CEO of the Austin, Texas Urban League for five years. So um, I'm uh, delighted to be here and looking forward to, to sharing this stage uh, with my classmates. Excellent. And it's, I'm glad to have you both here. I know one of the things that we talked about before we came on air is the fact that both of you have backgrounds with the Urban League. So, Ted, I want to start with you. Can you describe for our viewers uh, what the Urban League is? Uh, both from a national standpoint, as well as what you do specifically in the Carolinas? Sure. So the National Urban League is, is a historic civil rights organization. Uh, we were founded in 1910, one year after the NAACP in 1909. And for 100 plus years, uh, we've been fighting the fight uh, on the ground, um, uh, delivering services to, to the community. But specifically, the Urban League's mission is social and economic equality for African-Americans and all underserved people. We're currently in 90 cities, uh, 35 states. 
I mentioned that I had been in, in uh, Arizona and Texas before here. And in, in Charlotte at the Urban League of Central Carolinas, um, we, we focus in, in essentially four or five areas, uh, education, uh, jobs and, and livable wages, affordable housing, healthcare and, and entrepreneurship, in addition to the civic engagement piece. What I will tell you more than anything else, Chuck, is the Urban League is focused on wealth building. It, it, it is really critical, and I'm sure we're going to get into more about the racial wealth gap, but um, that's essentially the, the why of, of why we do our work every day. Excellent. And with, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Malika. Malika, one of the things that I have found fascinating about you over the last five or six months is that you are work, walking in your purpose. I know that you have taken the leap of faith and stepped out and started some of your own small business concerns. So will you take our uh, viewers through your process, what it is that made you make the jump and what the jump looks like uh, so that maybe we can inspire those who are interested in doing the same uh, real soon? Sure, sure. Um, so again, I worked in corporate America, nonprofit for over 20 years. Um, but in 2008, I came up with the brand name for DNA Marketing. In 2012, I incorporated DNA Marketing, and I took the leap and really did it in 2018. So it was a 10-year journey for me to actually get there. I've been doing a lot of you know, side hustle work, helping people out, developing marketing plans for small businesses. Hey, Malika, how should I do this? And I loved it. I loved the partnership. I loved helping people excel. And so I finally decided, you know, um, I, I got laid off, actually. So that was something that kind of pushed me, and I, I call it God all day. Um, so I got laid off in 2017 and, um, you know, had to really think about it, looked for jobs. And then I decided this this is really what I want to do. Like this hustle, the hustle feeling that I felt like when I first was out there, just cold, not knowing what to do. I was like, I actually get energy from that. I actually enjoy that as much as I enjoy working with these folks to uh, develop their small businesses. So um, so I did it in 2018 and, and launched DNA Marketing, um, launched with many, many referrals and so much support especially from our spellhouse family um, which is a which is a blessing uh, for us uh, class of 94 has truly come through for me and and beyond um, and so that's what I'm doing every day and then I, we'll talk a little bit later about some some new stuff that I'm working on but we were talking about walking in your purpose and and the journey to get there and the ability to find that realize it and lean into it so um, I'm so happy that I that I did and have not looked back no, I totally respect that. And Malika, what's interesting, and Ted, I'm going to come back to you in a few, is that when I was a younger lawyer back in, I want to say, early 2001, I was in one of those positions where I had started off, y'all, as a prosecutor and then became a criminal defense attorney. And I was working for a solo practitioner here in Tallahassee. And man, I was still driving the same old great Volvo that I had back at Morehouse, right? And, you know, had those student loans coming in from law school. Uh, money was tight. And yet I was noticing that my employer, uh, for all the work, all the grind that I was doing, things seemed to be doing really well for him. And he didn't want to talk much at all about uh, profit sharing or any of that. In fact, one of his quotes was, you work for me. And like, you know, I joke about that now. But looking back at it, I realized that, you know, one month I remember he bought his wife a new Benz. The next month he bought himself a new a dually truck. Then the month after that, he bought his son a dually truck. And then the month after that, got his daughter a uh, Toyota Solera. And I'm still pushing that uh, 88 Volvo uh, yeah. that I had up in Morehouse. And so I was like, OK, something's got to give. And I, I took the leap of faith, too. And what's interesting about that, Malika, you just made a comment about the Spellhouse family uh, providing so much love. Uh, what was interesting for me is I don't know if you all were fans of the TV series, The Wire, but I remember in one of those uh, seasons when the boxer Cuddy was trying to approach Avon Barksdale with the concept of I need some money to get some equipment for the young men that he was teaching how to box. And he was hemming and hawing and nervous of asking about the 15000 that he needed. And when he finally spat it out, Avon and Slim Charles looked back at him and they burst out laughing. And they were like, man, go ahead and give this cat 20 so that he could go do what he needed to do. Well, my story was very similar in that I did not have a line of credit. I did not have uh, any low interest loan that was provided to me by a bank who helped me were Daryl Parks and Benjamin Crump. You all may not know 
Daryl as well. He's your frat brother, Teddy. I know Daryl very well. Exactly. But Ben Crump, everybody knows Ben. And I was in their office one day and Daryl rolled back in his seat, undid his uh, safe, and he threw out five stacks on the table. And within six months, I was able to return that back to him and never look back. So with that, it is so important to be able to network, which Teddy then brings me to you. Uh, how does the Urban League help with either capitalization for small businesses or other entrepreneurs who are interested in stepping out of the paycheck world and going into the paycheck producing world? Well, so so it's a good question. First, let's just talk about the mentality. Uh, I call myself a social entrepreneur, Chuck and Malika. Th uh, to be honest with you, uh, I mentioned that uh, we are in 90 cities, um, you know, have a staff, uh, a building that I operate, all of that. The only difference between uh, the Urban League here in Charlotte that's in a nonprofit and someone else with 16 full time folks in a building is that there's a tax exemption, right? And so uh, I tell people, I don't run a nonprofit. I run a tax exempt business that serves people. That's a mentality. Um, and so um, when it comes to small businesses, I mentioned uh, wealth building. And, and that's the, that's the, the crux of, of how we do our work. So let, let's talk about a little data. I mean, you know, all of us have to have to have a why. Um, I like to talk about statistics. And you all have heard the stories about the racial wealth gap. Well, I mean, we'll go back to like 2017, Great Recession time. Things are things are different, um, but there are national studies, and this started to get illuminated. At that time, uh, the the median net worth for a white family, regardless of background, was about 115 thousand dollars. At that same time, if you were a Latino or Hispanic family, it was 6,800 dollars, and if you were black, it was 4,400 dollars. Think about that. Not thousands but $100. And at that point, you, you look at yourself and say, hey, listen, what do I have to give back? Like, why are we doing this? And so when it comes to um, our clients and what we're doing for, for small businesses, it is really kind of focusing on asset asset building, whether it comes to a lot, a lot of these folks have new ideas and need to get started. So there's always the startup phase service wise from business plan to getting capital and getting started. Uh, but I'll tell you what I'm more interested in, Chuck. I'm more interested in getting black businesses to scale. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about that because a lot of times, and I know COVID-19 has thrown us for a big loop, but we talk about access to capital, almost, I, I think, to our detriment. We can get you loans, like and you had Parks and Crunk and others, and in certain communities, they find ways to get money to start businesses. But what we don't focus on is getting to scale. We have so many businesses that are kind of, kind of the mom and pop shop, one or two employees. And in every state, they have statistics on this. We've got to focus on taking the 12 black trucking agencies and having them combine, right, so that they can get to those larger contracts, so they can get to scale and we can really start putting uh, money back in our community. Very good. And and with that, Malika, one of the things that's interesting, you know, we were talking offline a little bit about COVID-19 relief funds. You know, there's been so much, uh, I don't know, double speak, double think coming from the current uh, presidential administration about what has been earmarked, what Congress has allocated, as opposed to what actually is getting into people's pockets. Malika, are you finding like as you continue on your journey uh, into as a small business owner and what have you, are you finding access to capital uh, something that is tenable from traditional lending sources, or is it has it been your perspective that the best option still is from family members, friends, uh, college community, and what have you? So I think that there is just an, a knowledge gap in general. For me, it was definitely friends and family all the way that kind of helped me get on my way. For sure. Um, I think that the, the path to getting funding, um, there's a really big gap in the knowledge and the understanding of that. And I want to continue with um, the data that Teddy started talking with. And, I, and I'm going to talk from the perspective of a black woman entrepreneur, because obviously that's what I am. When we look back at the Great Recession, black women started um, launching their companies um, at a growth rate of 164 percent versus all women who were starting businesses at 58%. So we have a lot of black women starting businesses. 
The problem is that they are making about 50% less than their non-minority counterparts, right? And they are not succeeding past three to five years. So when we're, when we're talking about scaling our businesses, Teddy, right, we need to figure out how to sustain and then how to scale. Um, and so that's why I've decided to, um, basically I'm gonna be launching a boot camp for black women entrepreneurs. It's gonna be called the Kalima Collective because to your original question, Chuck, we don't even know how to start to research that. There are so many grants actually right now. So it's not gonna be you know, government supplied and not even necessarily bank supplied, but there are so many corporations now that have grant money out there. But my question mark is how many of us know how to access those funds? So there, there is money out there and there's money earmarked for black women business owners in particular, period, right? Um, there are um, pieces and parts of that, including having a proper banking relationship. That was a big issue when PPP first came out, having a proper banking relationship. So there's an education gap um, and a knowledge gap that we want to um, try to really explore and expand that knowledge within this community of black women business owners. No doubt about it. And one of the things, Teddy, uh, one of the things, Malika, is once you get everything squared away with Kalima Collection, I definitely want you to come back on to once you're ready to launch to make sure that we blast that. We'll have a segment just strictly on that. Ted, I did not mean to cut you off. Go ahead, brother. No, no, no worries. I wanted to, to, to back what Malika was saying up. Uh, it, it's very true. Um, it, the, the collective is exciting. But here's what you're doing. You're just diversifying the types of the types of revenue streams and ways that you can make money, right? Or, and help people grow. And so the knowledge gap is is, is critical. Um, when you when it comes to banking relationships, you need one. You need multiple. And and we've got a education is still key to all of this. Um, there are multiple people out there that want to be Malika Dowdell that want to get to that point. And they, they, they're in a starting block and they get started. I heard that three to five years uh, uh, statistic. The question is, all right, how do you sustain, but what the, what kind of innovation do you have? We talk a lot about in our, in our services. Listen, um, you got this phone now and technology is where it is. You can be so many places at, at certain times. You got to be innovative, but you got to diversify. If you think in one way of making money, um, you, you, it's hard to sustain. It really is. But as you grow and that network grows, uh, you can expand over time. What's interesting is with that, when you're talking about sustaining and scale, I want to throw this question at both of you, uh, social media, what role does that play in helping that particularly with regards to small business owners and people of color? Uh, who wants to go first on that? Yeah. So I, I, I'll start up. I, I think it's, I think it's absolutely critical. Um, I, I think if you don't have a presence and in, in managing your brand, which is an industry in and of itself now, um, then then you know you're just starting from from zero. Uh, I think you have to have a presence, Chuck. You've built your business and things you're do, doing off of social media, but the, the key with it is to understand the business model. You have to differentiate. Social media can go a lot of ways. And people use it for certain things, but you have to understand the business model of, of social media. So whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter or all of these things, what is the business model to get you to profitability over time? And I think some people go wrong on social media by thinking more of brand and themselves versus the bottom line. It is a great tool if used prudently to get yourself to profitability, but you have to be there. You have to be there. And it's, it's also a way I believe that COVID-19 is at a point, you know, we're, we're all zoomed out and, 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 all, and all, all these things. I actually think it's great because you can reach more people. Um, six months ago, we didn't think like this in a virtual world. Some people did, but now it is the norm. Well, as a business owner, an entrepreneur, you got to take advantage of that. You can use technology and social media to reach multiple people in ways that we didn't even think about six months ago. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. One of the things that's interesting about that is, as you both know, I have written for a number of years, both in my own blog, as well as for The Hill, New York Times and other uh, media. But what was interesting is this particular platform was born from watching one of our classmates, one of my frat brothers, Tronny Blaze. Uh, Tron started doing those midday sets uh, <laughs> when we were all stressed out. And not only was it helping to alleviate the stress, 
But when Noob started putting that cash ha app handle up and we were recognizing he was making money from it, too, I was like, you know, uh -huh. this, this is a heck of a hustle right here. And then, like you say, Ted, the, the Zooms, the, I know we're all sick of being on virtual this and virtual that, but I also see opportunity in it as well. And that, again, we get the opportunity to not only link up from the standpoint of being brothers and sisters and friends, but we also are able to provide our stories uh, to the public so that, again, other people may be inspired. Malika, what are your thoughts with regards to social media and being able to help, uh, you know, buttress whatever uh, small business activities are already happening for people who are desiring to be entrepreneurs? Absolutely. Social media is a relationship building tool. Regardless of what your business is, you need clients, you need people to buy your product, and you need to build a one-to-one -one relationship with them, and social media enables that. Um, you have to be strategic about how you build your brand. A lot of people know how to you know, do their widget or, or their service or their craft, but how you communicate about it is just as important, right? And so making sure that your social media presence is, is buttoned up and that you have a voice that transcends who you are personally and really speaks into what your business brand is. So we talked a little bit about, you know, Chuck Hobbs of 94 and Chuck Hobbs right now, right? So right. you have a, a brand that you are, obviously it's very important and it's an amazing brand. And it's something that we always have to keep our eye on the prize. And again, as Teddy said, we have so many different platforms and each of those platforms does a different thing. And to be, to really understand the power of each of those, Twitter is a little bit chatty, whereas Facebook is kind of more conversational, whereas Instagram is a visual platform, but you've got the hashtags going, you've got people sharing content and understanding that you can jump into a conversation if you use the right hashtags. There's the, the conversation about, should I spend money on my posts to get it out to a broader social circle than that, which I currently have. So it is absolutely important to make sure um, that as a business owner, you really are considering what your social media presence is, for sure. Yeah. Y'all, what are some things that we can do to to get past some of the ignorance that I see? Uh, and I know you all see it, too. Sometimes on social media, people making comments about who they would support, who they would not support from a business standpoint. Uh, one of the memes that always makes me laugh when I see it, uh, laugh to keep from crying, is the concept of when your friend or family member is in business, support them. Don't always look for the hookup. Don't look for uh, getting things done for free. What are some things that we can do to make sure that as consumers, we do a better job of making sure that we spend money within our own community as opposed to saying, hey, I like Malika's idea, but I'm not going to give her any money on that. I'd rather go give Mr. Charlie my money on that. Anybody want to speak to that? Yeah. So I, what I'll say is it's about intent. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm unapologetically pro-Black in, in what I do. And so I'm intentional. And when I have to spend money and, and I'm supporting things, I'm looking for black excellence first. Right now, um, let's go. I said excellence. Right. Uh, because part of our issue is, you know, we're hard on ourselves. We really are. Like we, we will give ourselves a shot. The one little incident and all now we're out. And, and that's just the wrong way to go about it. When I'm dealing with business owners and people I want to spend money with, if there are issues, I'm going to let them know, first of all, because I'm thinking about making you successful. When I am, I'm going to tell you just, what I, just like I would a white owner. Here is my issue with the service. Here is what I saw. So I want you to correct that. But that doesn't mean I'm never coming back. Uh, and I think we have to be very intentional on how we go about connecting and how we spend our money. It, 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 we have a mentality crisis in the black community and we do it all the time, but perhaps in this new era where, and I don't know if it's really so new, but you know, where people are, where people other than black people are supporting our issues. We, we, black people need some self-esteem. That's really what we need. We need self-esteem. And so I, you know, I want to piggyback on that because intent really is the thing. And, and I challenge people, especially in, in this time when we're not getting out as much, can you look at the budget that you currently have and can you carve out a little bit of that and make that your black business budget, right? So think, I'm not asking to expand what your spend is, I'm asking you to focus what your spend is. So for all my ladies with, with natural hair, we're out in Target buying brands that are probably not black owned brands, 
There are black owned brands in Target, Spelman Own, Curl Theory. There are black owned brands, Live So. So I need to, I'm gonna need hair products, right? So I'm gonna pay money for those anyway. So can we have a black business budget? Secondly, amplification is important. So if there's one black business or two black businesses that you love, if you're not a business owner, can you amplify those? Can you tell your network about those and be intentional about pushing that out? We can't be passive about this because guess who's not going to be supporting us? We saw it, we saw it in March, April and May of this year. We don't support one another. We're not going to learn and grow. So that's my that's my challenge to all of us watching right now is to really be intentional, focus your spending, earmark those dollars, and amplify the businesses that you've worked with that are great. Those are great ideas, Malika and Ted. And one of the things that I have seen here in Tallahassee, Florida, that has worked so well, and I know that there are variations on this theme across the country. Uh, we have what is called the Capital City Black Pages down here and it's a listing of every black business in the area uh you name the industry if it's black owned it's in that book and people can access it so that they can make you know people can make great decisions with regards to who to spend their money with i would like to see uh, a similar national database so to speak uh, i'm sure there might be some but maybe we can even do more to expand upon that in the days ahead because again there are so many people that we know personally who are doing some wonderful things out here but if the word is not out as to what it is that they are doing across the country people will never know and so we we definitely in future shows uh should be able to do that and highlight uh the excellence that's coming just from spellhouse and hbcu love across the country um i just want to say to that point so black pages are, are not new they happen in, in in cities all over the country and have for decades mm -hmm. but let's go back to technology right so they're they're apps now where you know you don't have to you, don't use excuses that you can't find us right black owned businesses can be found in that phone and in most cities you can put that in there there are plenty of cities that have apps that say hey it doesn't matter what the category is here's how you can get to us so again the technology think about it use it because we got to get off of the 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 old school way of just printing right you know we push that and you have to you got to compete um and so black papers and all that they're all dealing with this but the black pages has to be virtual and when it does we can keep moving and one more point google has actually enabled uh, a notification classification of black owned business to their business pages if you have a business page um, and google's picking it up you can add that tag to your business Wow, that is helpful. Thank you, Malika, for saying that. And again, while we clearly are focusing on black owned uh, and, and black entrepreneurship, at the same time, we also recognize that we live in a world uh, where there will be people of other races who may want to patronize or do patronize us as well. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I did not know that uh, through the course of my career, uh, some of my best paying clients were, uh, were, were of other races. Uh, likewise, some people who support observation point uh, faithfully are of other races as well. So what I want to segue into next is how do we uh, and from the Urban League standpoint and Malika from with what you're doing uh, with Kalima as well as with DNA, what are some things uh, that both of you are doing with regards to making sure that your services from an organizational standpoint or business standpoint also are able to attract dollars from other communities? Yeah, so Chuck, I'll start on this one. From an Urban League standpoint, you know, our mission is, is again, social and economic equality for, for Black folks and all underserved. And But but from day one, we have been a multiracial organization, um, from our board to our staff to our client base. And uh, I, for us, it's about disparity elimination. So when we, when we talk about these stats, we're not just talking about Black people. We're talking about our brown brothers. We're talking about whites. We're talking about rural versus urban. And, and we have to be intentional about promotion of, of, of their needs as well. And when it comes to whether you're trying to sell to different um, communities or for us raise money, for example, it is a specific strategy, okay? It, it is a specific strategy. And the strategy is to who has the dollars, right? And, and for us, it's who believes in our mission. 
It really doesn't matter to me what your race is necessarily, as long as you believe in our mission. It's the same thing with HBCUs. We are proud of our history. We are all about what we've done and will continue to do, but we're open to everyone. And we're as good or better than white organizations. But you just have to understand that and then be with us. Malika, what are your thoughts with regards to uh, attracting dollars from people outside of the community as well? Dollars that ultimately will matriculate through our community once you uh, receive the receipts from PayPal, Cash App or regular banking institutions. Um, you know, from a from the DNA marketing perspective, I've worked with a myriad of people. Um, I've had, you know, my my white friends who have supported me as well, who are, you know, super allies, right? And so I'm appreciative of them as well. And we'll continue to work with them. There's there's no reason to to say this is these are the only people that I'm going to be working with. As far as Kalima, um, I I really had a conversation with myself around should this be, you know, for all women or for black women. So that was a, a very real and honest conversation that I had. And when I started to dig into the data and I saw the disparities and understanding some of the, the history around, you know, why black women are fleeing corporate America, you know, workplace issues and some of those things that, you know, might not um, be equal across black and white women. Um, but I, I do believe that in the future, we will all be one collective because there is, again, my, my time with the Cornell program was amazing and it really brought together all women and we were all able to speak about our um, our business issues and processes and growing and learning. Um, so I think that there's a place for both, but again, it needs to be intentional. Everything that we are all doing in this journey really needs to be intentional because we need to understand what the end of our story is gonna look like. What's that last chapter and how are we gonna get there? Um, and so plotting the journey in that way. Malika, I like how you put that uh, being intentional and plotting the journey. Because again, one of the things that we have talked about as a group uh, before we went on air is what does success look like? I think if nothing else, COVID-19 uh, this past year, uh, it has been hell for so many of us in so many ways. And one of those ways has been the catastrophic loss of life. There are very few black people in this country who have not been touched by the pandemic, either by people being sick or people dying. And with that in mind, there have been quite a few people that we have all lost that we knew either they went to spell house with us or they grew up with us. And, you know, when you start to see the obituaries coming out for people who were born in 1970, 71, 72, 73, it hits a little different than it does when we were younger and thinking, well, death is so far off. And so with that, I know I find myself often thinking, what does success look like? Is it a monetary thing? Uh, is it notoriety? What is it? And so with that in mind, uh, Malika, I'll start with you and then I'll shift to Ted. What would success, what does success look like to you for DNA as well as the Kalima uh, collection moving forward? For DNA, success looks like us being the go-to um, marketing shop for small businesses. Um, as a small business owner, obviously you have a limited budget, um, limited time. You're the only person doing everything. And so we are built differently. We are priced differently. We service differently. And so I want us to be able to scale to your point, Teddy, that's absolutely the truth. I want us to be able to, to scale, to be the one to go to, because we know how to handle small businesses. A lot of marketing agencies go for the big dogs, right? Like they're going out for those corporate dollars because those are the bigger dollars. If we're, if we're going to be super, super honest. So, so that is success for me with DNA is continuing to be a very strong resource and ally for my clients and marketing partners and the Kalima collective. The vision is to close the gap and to create a, a vibrant community of very successful black women business owners. So we'll grow from the boot camp, you know, into regional conferences, into national conferences. As we spoke earlier, I grew up, I'm an urban league baby. So I know about a good conference, Teddy McDaniel. Yeah, we <laughs> <laughs> um, but to, to create a community of support and success for the Kalima Collective and confidence, um, because I believe that's lacking as well. So. A lot of tall orders, a lot of long nights, but I'm here for it and I'm ready to do it. Yeah. So, um, Chuck, you asked about what success looks like and, and really um, on, on an annual basis. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Urban League in Charlotte and what we're looking at around the country. 
I, mean, I always go back to the fact that we are measuring um, the disparities every year. And every two years we put out State of Black America and all that stuff is 40 plus years old. But success really looks like uh, taking black businesses, for example, and taking them from subs to primes. Okay? I, I want to see businesses that, that scale and become the, the go to, whether it's Malika in, in marketing or, or the construction when the stadium is built. I want a black owned company to be the prime to do that. And so, so it, it's being very specific in, in helping them helping them scale up. Now, but but you also asked about legacy. And at the end of the day, for me, um, and 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 it's about leaving what I found better when I leave than than when I found it. Uh, I, I want this urban league to grow. I want us to serve more people. I want businesses to grow. I want, for the most part, I want to see that racial wealth gap. Lesson and eventually eliminated. Uh, we have a saying, you should do your job so well you put yourself out of business. Imagine that. Like, I want to be able to do some other things. Um, but it, it's going to take a lot of work, um, a lot of intention, and, and the fulfillment. We talked about that off, offline. You know, if I, if I can every day or every month see progress and people growing, then I'm walking in my purpose and, and, and my legacy will be fulfilled long term. Understood. And with that in mind, I want to one of the last questions I want to take is we talk a lot about our time on the yard. Now, I'm going to miss both of y'all uh, next month. I have been in withdrawal since probably around July when the president uh, from Morehouse decided that there would be no football, which was the right decision. Clearly, uh, Morehouse and Spellhouse again at the vanguard of making wise decisions with regards to the bodies of young black males, not putting them at risk to play uh, a game. But with that in mind, I have been in withdrawal since July because we all enjoy going back to homecoming every October and having an opportunity to fellowship, reminisce and get recharged for the rest of the year. With that, I want to ask you, what is a lesson or what are some lessons that you learned from your days at Morehouse and Spellman uh, respectively that actually continue to propel you each day as you uh, uh, go on your, your your corporate or entrepreneurial journeys? Malika, you want to start? We, we, this could be a session in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, on my daily journey, especially in this life of an entrepreneur, it's really challenging myself, right? So we we were so lucky. We were talking about this. Our competition on the yard was never competition. It was always a push to be great. We were raised and surrounded by greatness on the yard. And so I can look around in my community and my circle at my girls and always wanna to continue to reach for the stars. And so it's always this self challenge, like push yourself to be better. There's nobody else that can be a catalyst for that. You have to have your own fire in the belly. And I think that my fire in the belly was lit when I walked through those gates at Spelman College. Yeah, it's uh. So I was born into it, right? I was born literally on the campus, and um, the beauty of Morehouse and Spelman, and my mother's a proud Spelman grad as well, um, is that I, I call it the Black Lab, right? And and so a couple things that I that I learned that I keep with me, and and part of it is is actually pushing white people, to be honest with you, because one of the things I like to say most in in, in various situations is that we are not monolithic. Um, I, I, the beauty of the black diaspora is no better displayed than uh, at Morehouse and Spelman and at black colleges. I mean, you know, you go from uh, your high school days and growing up to, to being with certain types of black people and you may meet, you know, the guy who smokes cigarettes and listens to rock music as much as you do the hip hop crowd. And, and, and to this day, uh, I love, I like challenging the thought of whites and others on what black people are. Um, so that's one lesson. But probably the biggest is just lift as you climb, right? Like we, we, we are blessed to have careers and families, like a lot of people do, that are doing well. But I, I just, you know, I'm into this work every day because I wanna see others blossom. I really do. And if I'm not lifting someone up, then I'm not doing my job. That, that is the legacy. And I think Morehouse and Spelman taught us that better than anywhere else because people open the door and lit fires in us. 
And, and so the fire keeps burning and we got to keep giving back. We got to keep giving back. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, you know, I don't want to put the age out there because, again, you've got Malika on here still looking like she's 18 years old while I've got all this salt and pepper in my beard looking like Old Man River. Hey, hey, I used to have a little hair, Chuck. I I remember remember we had those high top fades, right? That that, that was long ago and far away. But, but, But with that in mind, one of the things is when we stepped on the yard 30 years ago, I think the thing that uh, like Ted and like Malika, like you were saying, I was inspired right from the jump. Uh, I remember that Sterling Hudson, our old director of admissions, uh, during our orientation week was discussing what he called d- diminished significance. And the way he explained that was we all came from schools where we were the top dog, uh, so to speak, academically, uh, sometimes socially and athletically as well. And so here you are, you're in class with men and women who are equally motivated, equally bright. Uh, Some of those days were just amazing to me, just being around people like you and being able to converse about topics that are, are, are so diverse. And that is one of the reasons why I'm continuing to do this. And I hope to have you both back as much as you would like, because, you know, sometimes when you're sitting up and you're reading, being on social media or even traditional media articles, you know, you hear people who are from the white community. Oh, Barack Obama was so articulate. Or I remember I had a trial once and I had a judge in the panhandle near Pensacola said you are the most articulate colored fellow I have ever heard. And I was sitting there like not wanting to necessarily say what was on my mind because I would have been held in contempt. But the fact of the matter is there are so many people who are not aware of how very talented so many of us are. And so I enjoy having the opportunity to be able to bring my friends on and showcase uh, your diverse talents and and introduce those to people who watch and pay attention, who think that I might be the only one. So with that in mind, again, I appreciate both of you. With that, uh, starting with Malika first, we'll go ahead and do a closing statement. And then Ted, you'll be next. And then I'll close this one out for the afternoon. Malika, is there anything else you would like to say to our viewers before we close this evening? Well, first, I, I want to say thank you again to you, Chuck, and thanks to everyone that, that tuned in for this conversation. Let's keep the conversation going. It should not take um, the death of anyone in our community. It should not take um, the mistreatment or any um, poor choice of words from our administration uh, to ignite a need and a desire to spend and support Black businesses. So if there was one thought to to leave you with is that we need to be consistent. So for in order for our businesses to sustain themselves and to scale, we as consumers need to be consistent. So um, please consider that and consider how you can add to this movement so that our community continues to grow. Thank you again, Chuck. You're very welcome. Uh, so it's- Ted, go ahead friend uh, for for having me. Malika, my sister, it's always fun. I mean, you know, we, we just we just had our own little mini homecoming. Um, <laughs> but um, first of all, as a civil rights leader, um, I, I want, uh, I, I think in terms of civil and economic rights every day. I really do. And um, so from a, from a business perspective, you know, to the audience, continue your wealth building mindset. Right. I don't even if you don't have a business and everyone should incorporate something, but you you should think as an entrepreneur. Uh, It doesn't matter uh, what your vocation is, but think about assets and lessening your liabilities long term. Um, I I also can't I'd be remiss if we don't talk about the coming election and I'm not going to get on a soapbox anything. But today is National Black Voter Registration Day. And so there are all kinds of debate going on. Uh, we need people to be aware. Uh, this election is the most important of our lives. And we're, we're talking about uh, registration, education, mobilization, and turnout. And we'll also protect you from it. So, Chuck, I look, at, I look forward to future conversations about different topics. You know, I, I want to get back in our sports stuff so we can talk that competition like we used to. But no, uh, thanks for having me, bro. No doubt, man. And I know that you're happy, Ted, that the Ohio State Buckeyes will. Yeah, Bucks will be back. I know you're watching your, your, your Tallahassee, that, that University of Florida. We, we, we can start, but we'll never get off the court. Uh, 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 <laughs> no. If we start that, we'll never get away. 
Not at all. And like I say, we're going to have so many different platforms. You know, I talked to our classmate, uh, Jay Mad, my frat brother, Jay Madison. Oh, yeah. you know, he's doing big things. Oh, yeah. big. Yeah. Exactly yeah. Right. yeah. So we're going to have some sips, some sips and smokes and things like that. And I'm talking about smoking cigars, not the uh, stick, <laughs> uh, other stuff in certain parts of the country. Uh, just say no. But with that, again, I thank you both for coming on. I love you both. Uh, and to those who listened and paid attention, thank you. Remember, buy black, buy black, buy black, be black, and make sure that you are registered to vote because like Ted just said, this is the most important election of our lifetimes and we have to make sure that we show up and show out. With that, thank you so much for paying attention to Observation Point Live this afternoon. I look forward to speaking to you at the next one.